Nikolai, thank you very much uh, for coming. I, I know it's late for you and you had a very busy day. So Nikolai wanted to be the last one pre to present because he has the, la the latest features of Java to present to us. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly the reason. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. It's really cool. Like to me, the time difference doesn't bother me, right? I was just like having lunch with, uh, sorry, dinner with my family, and now I'm here screaming into the void. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Nikolai, uh, thank you again, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Oh, well, I gotta actually share something, right? Uh, yes, uh, the this helps probably on top of your head, right? There it is. Okay, great. So hi, everybody. Um, to quote Brian Getz, I prepared too much, so I'm going to talk too fast. So um, I'm going to talk about myself if we have a couple minutes in the end. Let's get going. So yes, Java after 11, uh, by the way. that's the Usually the talk was called Java after 8, uh, but that's way in the past. Um, but that's where the chocolate theme came in, right? Because of after 8 chocolate. Um, so anyway, Java after 11 plus chocolate. There you go. So um, the plan for today is we're going to start with the Java 11 code base, and then we're going to update it all the way to 15 and a bit beyond that. Meaning, well, it was still going to stay on 15, but we're going to look at some preview features that were not really finalized yet. Um, and I hope that you're going to be amazed by how much changed even since 11, because for most people, 11 is pretty much the, the, the most modern thing they, that, that um, they could run on. Uh, and yet, there are greater things after that uh, to come. So this talk is not a tutorial, right? I don't have the time to teach you all the details of these features. I'm just going to slap your left and right with new stuff. So you're going to get out of here and be like a little bit dazzled, but also like, hey, that's really cool. Let's look into updating that. It's also not a complete list. And I have to tell, um, I stream on Twitch uh, occasionally, and uh, the people there have been very, very helpful. Like, at least half of the ideas in this code base were not mine, um, only the bad ones. So if there's a bad idea, it's probably mine. If it's a good idea, most likely somebody else. Um, if you go to slides.codefx.org, on the right-hand side, you'll see Java After 8. That's the header. You can see the slides there. And then you can also go to the link to the repository that I'm going through here. So if you want, if an IDE open, you can just do this on the site together with me. Quick uh, jump into Java 11 was released one and a half years ago, no, two years ago, actually, yeah, uh, September 2018. Um, Oracle just provided free support for just a couple of months. Um, but the community at large, under the guidance of Red Hat, uh, offers support until at least October 2024. So still a couple of years that we can enjoy this release. And um, there's more free and commercial support to be had, uh, lots of options there. So it's a great release. Um, it has the first modern Java release, meaning the first Java release after eight that has long-term support by many different vendors, free and charged, uh, free and uh, and and um, uh, and um, monetary, as I mentioned earlier. It has a really solid feature set. Not only everything cool in Java eight, also the module system var is pretty neat. And like Java nine brought a bunch of API improvements that are easy to miss uh, that I would normally show in the stock. But uh, so that's really good. Eleven great feature set. It's pretty stable. And I already mentioned the support there, right? But things are already moving forward. So while it seems like 11 is, well, not, not cutting edge, but pretty much still the edge, uh, there are really new language features that are either already released or are in the making and to be released and finalized very, very soon. Uh, a couple of improved APIs, a few very interesting new JVM features. And usually performance improves, although there's an there's a asterisk there. It doesn't always. Actually, in the specific code that I wrote, we're going to see that it's not actually getting much better. OK, so let's show you how much you're missing out if you're still on Java 11. And I'm saying this a bit facetiously, fish, well, whatever, how will you say that word? Anyway, so I'm not, I'm not entirely serious here. I know there are good reasons to stay on Java 11. I don't want to shame anybody into updating. But still, if you have the chance, take a look. So let's start. Um, let's go look at the code base. So this is a Java 11 code base, pretty um, generic, nothing, specific, nothing, nothing much special going on. What it does is. Um, this is actually a recommendation engine that I wrote for my own blogs, for my blog and blog posts. So I have articles there, I have a couple of talks there, I have a bunch of videos there, and these are all markdown files. Um, they have, oh crap, we don't want to have the preview though. So there's, there's a markdown file here, right? So we have this front matter here, which is like a title, and then they have tags on each post and a date and, you know, stuff like that. And then the content is down here. And uh, what I want to have is, in the end, I want uh, to recommend. So, oh, you saw so you've read that blog post. Why don't you read this blog post ne next? You know, like most blogs do. And this is what this engine does. So really, um, it looks about how related things are. That's where the term genealogy comes in. Uh, so the basic um, domain model is this. It's in this repository post. And you can already see there's a title there, and there's a title there. 
there's tags, and then there's tag there. So there are these, these small classes here that basically wrap each of these information, right? There's no date class here because we have date time for that. We don't need that. But for slug, there's a slug class. And this stuff is very simple, most of these classes. It's just like basically a slug is a string, but I like to have proper types, not just throw strings around all day long. So I have a proper type wrapping that string. So that's what slug does, for example. And then you have an article, for example, here, an article has a title and a couple of tags and dates. You know, and you can see how this you know, puts, uh, gets together. Uh, the factory is in, in charge of parsing these files and you know, creating the proper instances. And once we've parsed and created these instances, they go through this uh, genealogy API. So there's a genealogist API here. Um, it's decoupled. I'm going to show that in a second. And the genealogist is very simple. I'm going to give you two posts, and you're going to tell me how they're related, how much they're related. Give me a score between 0 and 100, how much you know, are they related. Um, and once you pipe all the combinations all the, of all the posts through this genealogist or several of them, you end up uh, with something that, you know, that's basically what this code here does, the genealogy does, that it takes a bunch of posts and a bunch of genealogists and then it pipes all of them through that. And then you end up with a recommendation engine, also pretty straightforward. Um, give me all of these relations between the posts and then let me know how many recommendations you want to have per post. And then I sort them and give you for each post like these three other um, things that you can look at. OK, so that should somewhat work. Let's have a look Let's at Java for which versions. It's Java 11 running here. You can also have Ma as Maven for that. No. Yeah, I got it. Shut up, IntelliJ. Um, so you can see Maven uh, 3.6, Java 11 is running. Uh, so let's quickly execute this. I'm going to build this quietly with Maven in the background. That's why you don't see any output, but that's what happening right, what's happening right now. And then we're going to run it 10 times. And this is a very superficial performance test that should by no means uh, be reproduced to make any meaningful decisions, but it gives us a little bit of an indicator. So this took like 1.1 1, 1 seconds roundabout. And you can see that we got 2,150 lines of code. So put a pin into that. Uh, let's say. 2160 lines of code and about 72,000 characters because we're going to see this number drop while the code base improves. OK, so let's go. Let's go to Java 11. Um, let's go to the parent POM. And if you, if you think that updates, oh, look, it says 8 here. That's a bit weird. Let me see. This shouldn't say 8. Um, Why does it say eight? Oh yeah, probably didn't check out the right version. Uh, we should be on this one. And now it says 11. OK, so I actually didn't see the right stats there. Then let, let's do this again, because this is already right. So the code base, as I said, goes back to Java 8. Uh, on Java 11, we can already see a bit of an improvement when it comes to size. So remember, we had uh, 2,160 lines of code. And now we have, well, we dropped like 100 lines of code. And we got like a couple milliseconds longer, but this is surely below what can be uh, this, uh, precisely measured. So there you go. Uh, we dropped like 3,000 characters in 100 lines of code. Now, let's go to 12 now. Oh, that was the original goal, right? And the first thing we're going to notice is if we go to 12, uh, that then Surefire actually doesn't do its job anymore. Um, so, you know, it can't see, oh, well, that's not what's happening yet, because we also have to switch the Java version, of course, that we execute this with. OK, so once again. Building this with Maven, uh, but it fails because the Surefire plugin says it's unsupported file major version 56. And that's going to happen if you update beyond the long term support release. Occasionally, some of your dependencies will not be quite up to date. Um, the solution for that is, is because the reason for that is ASM. And if you update the ASM dependency of Surefire, then this problem goes away. So let's have a look at the Surefire plugin. There it is, Surefire. Let's add this dependency that I've copied from off screen. Um, control shift go right. So, okay, so now we're on Java 12 and we have a new ASM version. And now this should work. And now we can start using Java 12 features. Right, there you go. It, it, it runs, it does its thing. Good. So, the first thing I want to show you in Java 12, it's a really small thing, but it's really cool too. Um, so, you know, Completable Future, right? Completable Future has been around since Java 8 and ha has a rather big API. There are like tons of different, basically, orthogonal concerns that this API solves. And then the API is more or less the combinatorial explosion of all of these possibilities, right? Do you want to do stuff on just any thread or does it have to be async? 
uh, are you dealing with things that return a completable future or just the pure result, like a map flat map situation? Or you have to handle errors as well, stuff like that. And there's a lot going on and a few holes were still left and some of them are being plugged. So this, for example, is a bit unfortunate. So I check something, but the important part is that after this, I get a completable future of the a string array that I have here. Now, what I want to do then, if that does not work, if there's an error, I want to do something else. And this something else also returns a completable future. So this is a classic flat map situation, like in a stream or an optional, right? Flat map, flat map exceptionally flat map didn't exist before. It does now. So um, instead of having to actually execute this and then join within the Lambda, which is a bit unfortunate, uh, we can now say exceptionally compose. There it is. And now we can just, oh, it's static, right? Yep. Yeah. So we need the class name. It's, it's config, if I remember correctly. Oh, right. It doesn't have the right parameters. Uh, so actually, we cannot use a method reference, but we can get rid of the join. So that's good. Uh, this is no special syntax I use here. I just use two underscores to say I don't care about the parameter here. So that's one cool thing. And then another one that's new is um, if you call something like exceptionally or comp or, or um, I think then is the, what's what's the name of the of the non-exceptional case anyway. Um, on a computable future, you're not guaranteed that it's actually going to run a background thread. You can use async for that, and that's new as well. That you can now um, have comp uh, exceptionally async, so that you can force the computable future pipeline uh, for this step to be its separate thread and not running the uh, potentially in the same thread that you're calling this, for example. Um, Okay, yeah, but sorry. Uh, yeah, you can see the bottom line here. That's a bit unfortunate. Uh, what can I do? Yes, we can do something. Let's pull in. Um, da, 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 da. Let's pull in another terminal, and then because we can, you know, and then we can do this. Um, and this won't work because I also have to select Java twelve here. And now we can run this here. And now this should not be covered by my image, right? That should be better. So now we're building and running this with completable future updates. Um, yep, and here you can see the stats. OK, so that's just a nice little improvement of, uh, of, an, of, an, of an already existing API. Um, in other news, or rather in, in related news, um, something similar happened to the stream API. So. There is something that I'm doing here that happens quite often for me. Um, I have a this stream of typed relations. And what I now want to do is like, so that means a typed relation is a relation between two blog posts that got a score, how related they are. And there's a type attached to it, meaning the kind of genealogist. I forgot to show you those, but they're different kinds, like the different ways to evaluate how similar blog posts are. You could compare the text, you could compare the dates, you could compare what the content is. Right, so there are different ways. And you know, if I use three of them, I get basically the same relation of two blog posts with three different scores in three different types. And I want to put them together. And what happens here is that I basically need an existing piece of information and a new piece of information. And, the and then I need both of those pieces in the next step of the pipeline. And if this happens, uh, then you're often in a situation where you're like you have to like this is not stream pipelines don't offer an off, obvious way to do that. Um, in this case, I got kind of lucky because it was was towards the end of the stream pipeline. And what you can do then is you can use a new cool kind of collector. The collector is called teeing. It means you get you get the stream of data in. It tees into two different collectors, and then takes the result and puts it together. I'm not gonna. Um, talk you through how exactly this piece of code that I'm now going to post uh, works. Let me see. Probably should copy all of it. Um, because it's a little bit complex. To un well, not complex. I could talk you through it in a couple of minutes. Um, but I'd rather spend those minutes with the cooler features, even cooler features towards the end. This is do a couple of imports here. Uh, and this one as well. Sorry, and I'm, I'm sure at some point I'm going to have all of these done. There you go. OK. So this mapping here, this teeing, sorry, takes two collectors. This is the first one and has some kind of result. And then this is the second one that also has some kind of result. And then I got two specific things, single, like a single thing, well, two single things that I can then put together. 
And that's what I'm doing here. So for example, let's say you have a bunch of numbers. You want to compute the average and the sum. That's really simple now with teeing because there's a collector that averages and there's a collector that sums. You can now use both of these collectors and then get the result in this function and put the result together any way you want. Um, that's a pretty cool feature that's new in 12 as well. The other cool thing in 12 is switch expressions. But it's a preview feature in 12. And we're going to look at it when we come to 14 because that's when it's actually finalized. Um, so let's skip uh, switch expressions for now. Uh, we can continue. These are the two big, two more interesting things I want to show you in Java 12. There's also improvement of um, class data sharing archives uh, that they now come, uh, that now is a default archive. Uh, but let's not, let's not go too deep into that. Um, instead, we're going to actually straight jump to Java uh, 14 because 13 has text blocks. Once again, we're not yet finalized, so I want to show you them when they are finalized. Uh, so there's nothing else I want to show you in 13. Um, so let's go to 14 instead. And now we can use switch expressions. Now, the problem is here that this code base doesn't actually switch a whole lot. <laughs> I had to force it a bit to actually show you a switch expression, OK? So if you look at this piece of code and think, well, there would have been a better way to solve this problem, you may be right. Like, right? It's a demo project. So here are the genealogists. They're in charge of, of comparing um, of comparing different uh, posts, right? They get two posts each, and then they're in charge of giving them a score. And one of them looks at the type of, an, um, of, a, of a post. A post can be an article, can be a video, or it can be a talk. And here, I basically assume that I want to give the different things, different scores. I want to say, maybe I could say, if you haven't read an article, I want to give you another article recommendation. If you've watched a video, I want to give you another video recommendation. But that's not actually what I want to do here. Instead, I want to say, look, I want to promote my videos. <laughs> so if the second post, the one that is going to be recommended, is a video, then I'm definitely going to give you a high score. OK, so well, how do I do this? I take the class name and switch over that. And if you cringe now, st stay with me. Um, we're going to come back to that in a, uh, in a bit later. But for now, that's what I'm doing here, right? I'm going to take the, the class, and I'm going to get the simple name, because that's the simplest thing to switch over. And then I'm do that. Then I'm doing that. OK, so with the, this is what, how you would do this um, if you don't pull the switch into its own method. You create, a, you create a variable. Then you go through a switch, assign the variable, and have to remember to break. And there's a bunch of uncomfortable things here. First of them, uh, you have to remember to break. Otherwise, things break. I think that's where the keyword came from. Should probably call it non-break, but uh, never mind. Um, and then also, you have to make sure that we covered all the bases, right? That we covered all the cases. So let's, let's, do, this, let's do a switch expression. A switch expression allows us to not have a switch as a statement, where it's basically like an if statement, but we can turn it into a, um, the, like the terminator, the conditional operator, basically, which means the switch as it's, on its own gets a value. And this is very simple. You can just ha write, have the switch on the right hand side of an assignment. Right? So then we say, well, the score is whatever the result of this is. And now there are two different ways to define this. You could do this. Uh, no, sorry, it's yield. Um, you can yield these values here. And then when you yield, basically yield is like a return from within a break, uh, sorry, from within a case. So um, there is not actually um, a fall through anymore, so you don't have to break. Even better, more concise, you can use this arrow form, which you already know from lambdas, right? So you can say, and I think this is really highly readable, well, if this thing is a string, oh, sorry, if this thing is an article, then the value result is 50. If the switch over this is a video, then it's 90, and so forth. Now, the compiler complains because I didn't cover all the bases, right? Like, the, like what, what if it's neither of these three? Well, unfortunately, uh, for now, I still have to do this. OK, now it's a, it's a statement, so I put that there. And that's the gist of switch expressions. And I think they're really, really cool. Um, great. So let's switch to Java 14. By the way, if you're using, uh, if you're not using SDK man yet, uh, when you occasionally switch between JDKs, I can highly recommend SDK man. Like this is what I'm using here. Uh, and that's, that's pretty cool, pretty cool tool to make this very, very easy. Okay. So now, now we can run this and, and let's see. So it still works. That's kind of cool. Um, 
okay, that looks good. Now let's check something else out. So I always, I'm a big fan of optional, like in this entire code base, there is no legal null value anywhere. Uh, so whenever something is null, it's always a bug. Um, which, and then many people are like, why don't you use optional so much? You shouldn't use optional. Null is a perfectly great value to use as a signal that something is not there. And you know, like, okay. <laughs> But then Oracle made this, uh, this kind of like a tournament of the different Java features <laughs> and the helpful NPE exceptions made it like into the semifinals or something, which is ridiculous because it's a pretty small feature. And if we just avoid null pointer exception, we don't have this problem. So I found it a bit weird <laughs> that uh, on the one hand, everybody tells me like, null is not that much of a problem, but a trivial feature like that won against amazing stuff like JFR or something. Um, so that was really weird. So uh, let's have a look from raw config. There's something here. Uh, 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 uh. Where was it? Create. Am I in the right folder? Yeah. Uh, something. I want. To, I want to have something here return null. We have to be clever about it because we don't return null in the right place. Uh, things are going to break. Hmm, I apparently renamed that method. So let's try returning now. What, let's see, create, where's that called? Where's create called? Oh, wait, that's called from the outside. Okay. Uh, 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 so I need something that returns when we return now there, that definitely leads to null pointer exception. So, you know, I can show you null pointer exception. Read project config. Let's try this. Let's try returning now here for now. Let's see where this works. Uh, return now. So now we're going to break this on purpose so we can see. Um, uh, oh, right, sorry, wrong kernel. I want, to run, I want to break this on purpose so we can see how the new null pointer exceptions look like. Great, okay. So this is a normal null pointer exception, right, that you can see on the right hand side. It says exception in the thread main. This is the null pointer exception. And then, you know, where it was exactly, but not much more. Now, um, let's have a look at the stats file. The actual command that runs is this. So let's use this to run. We're going to see the same null pointer exception. There it is. And now we're going to unlock these details that we can see. So this is a oh sorry, this is a command line flag that you have to add. It's um, xx and then show code details in exception message. If you run this, you get you know it starts the same way, but now the me exception message is there. It's now actual message. And it says, cannot invoke exceptionally compose async because the return value of this method is null. And if you're a developer, that might not make the biggest difference because you're already in front of your code, right? You get the line here. So that's already pretty helpful. Um, you can already get very far without this additional message. But imagine if there are different layers of support in your, uh, in, in your project, for example, maybe somebody who's not as technical, who doesn't have an IDE open and counters this error. This can really be helpful in various, uh, various situations. And on Java 14, you still have to turn it on. But I think on 15 or 16 or something, this is going to be the default. So from then on, we'll always see this. Um, good. Let's, let's, re let's mend the code. There it is. Works again. And now in 15, we can actually start using some of the newer things. Uh, which would, in this case, be text blocks. So the output that I create is this JSON file. Where is it? It should be somewhere here. Uh, IntelliJ doesn't see it. It should pop up there. The output of all of this is a JSON file, which basically says, well, if you've watched or looked, if you read this post, then the next one you want to read is that post. So I create a bit of JSON. And I'm not the biggest fan of taking an entire dependency for just a bit of code. So basically, this is all the code that actually writes the JSON. Well, actually, no, sorry, the method here writes the JSON. Um, but this is the only the JSON y part, so to speak. And you see that these are strings that go across several lines, but I have to use string concatenation and backslash n to make this somewhat readable. And this is where text blocks come in. And IntelliJ already promotes that, you know, replace with a text block. That was a bit helpful. Now I've got three quotation marks here. I don't have to put the new line there anymore. Um, the single quotation mark is no longer special, so the escaping went away, but we can do a bit better because we can use the indentation in the code base 
to define the indentation in the string. If you look at this string, you, you can much better see how it's indented. This looks reasonably like a, um, like a JSON part, right? You can now see, better see that this is proper JSON. Um, and that's really cool, right? So this, the marker here determines this line that you can maybe not see on stream, but that's a thin green line that IntelliJ put there. And from that line, the indentation will show up in the actual string. So if I indent this one more, you will see that everything is now also in the string indented a bit more. So that's, that's pretty nifty right there. Uh, another cool thing that was added together with this is a string format. So one thing that's quite common is to do something like this, right? Uh, we have a string that has uh, place, placeholders there for strings or for whatever under other data. And then you have to call string.format the, the uh, static method and then provide the data. It's a bit weird to do it roundabout like that. We're used to that, but why do we do it that way? And in Java 9, uh, sorry, Java 14, 15, that's where we are, right? Yeah. Uh, we now get a formatted method, an instant method. If you know format by heart, then this is not a big improvement. But imagine all the people coming new to Java, having a dot formatted method there makes much more sense for, to, most, for, to most of them, I guess. OK. Um, Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'm going to steal two more of your minutes uh, because what we're going to do now is we're going to see the big new features that come after Java 5, uh, sorry, Java 15, um, that are not yet. All, all I showed you now is stuff you should and could use in production if you're running on Java 15. But if you uh, want to look ahead, we have to unlock preview features. And that's what we're going to do now. So um, first of all, I'm going to tell Git to throw everything away that I just did. And then we're going to check out the upgrade branch. And if you look at the history here, as I said, it's linked in the slides. You can see master is in Java 8, and then we upgrade to 9, and then to other versions. And now we've done this text blocks and strings. Now we enable preview features and use record and sealed classes. Um, so oops, that was not on purpose. There you go. So one thing that's really cool is records. Earlier, I showed you these things here, right? That's luck. It was really simple. It was just like a string field and then a you know ton of getter, sorry, one getter and equals and hash code and two string and constructor and all of that. We don't need all of that ceremony, right? It's just a simple thing. It's basically just a string and a bit around that. An article, an article is just these couple of fields and not much more. And with records, we can now express that very succinctly and really describe um, if something is a real, just a data holder. And that's important to understand. We are expressing something and we're then in exchange don't have to do the boilerplate anymore. This should not be seen as I can avoid boilerplate. This should be seen as I can express that something is a record, a data holder. That's the more important part. The no boilerplate is something we get in exchange for that. So that's one big thing. Another big thing you might have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you might have not liked this very much. But like switch over the type here. Like what if a new type comes along? Then this falls apart, right? Now I can express that this is no longer possible. This is the newest preview feature. It's in Java 15, I uh, was introduced in Java 15, which is this sealed. I can now express that this interface post will only ever be implemented by these three classes. And if I would have another class, like right now, I move video here, if I go into the video class, I would see a compile error because I cannot actually implement post because it's not allowed in the sealed hierarchy. But so this way I can express within my code who is allowed to implement, sorry, who is allowed to extend and in, implement an interface or extend an abstract class, or not just abstract in general, um, um, a class. And then there's some other things like, for example, um, video either has to be final and records are already final, so I don't have to make it final explicitly, um, or they have to be uh, sealed themselves. So there's an interesting way that you can further manage that extension hierarchy. But between final class, which allows zero extensions, sorry, zero implementations, and not final, which allows arbitrary many extensions or implementations, you now have sealed, which is in between. Basically, you could see the old cases as special cases of sealed, where sealed aster permits asterisk is everybody can do that. You know, that's an actual syntax, right? But conceptually, a non-final class is a sealed class that permits everybody to implement it. And a final class is a sealed class that permits nobody to implement it. And now you can also express something in the middle. And with that, something like this becomes, uh, where was it? Like this becomes much more bearable. And in the future, we're going to be able to put proper types here. 
Nobody knows how that's going to look like yet, but actually, I guess a few people do. But let's assume it would be something like this. I, as I mentioned, this is not actual syntax, right? It's just me making stuff up to show your concept. Uh, oh, instance of. So this could be something in the future. And this works amazingly well with sealed classes because the compiler can know, oh, wait, this is a post. A post can only have these three implementations. I'm done. I don't even need a default branch. That's not there yet, but that's probably the next thing we're going to see out of this feature set here. Um, there was one more small thing I wanted to show you was that. Um, records. Uh, oh, yeah, pattern matching. Right. Last thing, then I'm going to let you go. Um, Let's go here. Um, but one thing I want to do here is I want to see whether two um, posts that I compare, whether they have a repository that's linked to them. That's an option. So it could be there, could not be there. And you know, I want to give a score based on that repository. Is it there or not? So I need to get a repository out of the post. The problem is not all posts do have a repository. Articles and videos have a repository. Talks don't. Oh, articles and videos may have a repository. Uh, talks don't. So I need to do once again, basically like something like an instance of. And what I would have done in the past would have been this, right? If I, if I already devolved so far that I had to go into instance of checking, usually you do an instance of, and then you still need to cast. It's a bit annoying. And so the new way to do this, also through the preview feature, is uh, you can write instance of. And then it matches, it's pattern matching, it matches on the type of video. And then um, you get the result of that match assigned as a new variable, which is of this type. So now I get a, a variable called video, which is of the type video, and then I can access stuff there. So um, that's uh, that's pretty cool as well um, to be able to do that. I mean, once again, so this, this, this feature and see it as well, none of those are like features like records. You got, I'm sure I'm going to use records every single day from now on uh, if I write a uh, Java code base that is you know, new enough. With seal classes and this, this pattern matching as far as it is now, not so much. But it's still really important if you have that, if you're in the case where you need it, or at least it's very helpful. Seal classes, is, it's important because you can do something that you couldn't do before. And this is really helpful because it's so much more comfortable to write something like this. And equals methods become really simple with this. If you want to do an instance of based equals method, it's so easy now. OK, um, we don't have time to go through this. I invite you to look at the slides, look at the code base. I just want to show you the final slide, uh, which will be this one. Um, if we look over this entire code base and look at the stats again, we start in Java 11 with this many lines, 2060, and we dropped like 500 of them. Granted, most of those are records, but still, that's a lot, right? We lost like a quarter of the code base. And I would argue the code got better for that. It's not more cryptic, more complex. It's just more expressive. It more, more clearly expresses what it's doing and as a side effect, basically, becomes less code. Uh, runtime, in this case, might go up a bit, but that's mostly because I'm using like the newest features. And sometimes the newest features in the newest JVMs are not as optimized as they were. If you run the Java 11 code, on the, with the JV, JDK 15, it's the same runtime. It's a bit faster, actually. Um, so it's just like these very new, very raw features. There might not have been that much um, uh, performance improvement packed into them. And then there was a bunch of things. Like, once again, look at the slides that I couldn't show you now. Like, multi release jars, we didn't look at those. There are GC improvements. There's a packager now. Um, with the Java Flight Recorder, data is now more, more freely accessible. So monitoring got better. There's so many things uh, that Java 15 uh, or Java after 11 um, makes, makes better or improves upon. And I can only invite you, if you have projects that have the chance to go beyond 11, to seriously consider it and uh, to stay on the six months release cadence. If you have questions about that, about like what are the trade-offs in upgrading to beyond Java 11, uh, what are the migration uh, problems, how can I use stuff? Like, for example, the module system we now skipped over because it was introduced in Java 9. Uh, reach out to me. You can either ask me here in chat or in the Slack or I'm on Twitter. I'm at MePathX, which is also there, mainly to hide my, uh, <laughs> my, my inbox, my actual physical inbox. Uh, but there you go. So you can find me on Twitter. And um, thank you very much for your time. Sorry that I took a couple minutes more. I hope you have a good rest of the conference. And uh, which is over, right? Is it over now, Ed? Did I get that right, Ed? Uh, almost, yes, right? well. Uh, your session was the last session of the track, and now we have a closing ceremony. Uh, if you, uh, but before that, 
amazing content it was a lot to process in just 30 minutes i'm pretty sure yeah. everybody was amazed and hopefully they will be migrating to the latest java version very soon and not java 1.4 anymore yeah <laughs> go from java 1.4 to java 15. It's basically just drop the decimal point <laughs> Perfect. Nikolai, it was amazing to have you. Thank you very much for attending our call. It was super nice to have you here. I Thank hope we talk in the next virtual conference because physical conferences appear to be like a distant future. And stay tuned. Uh, you posted our links here. Uh, we don't have time for questions now, but I hope people will reach out to you just in case they have uh, any doubts. And what I'd like to invite all of you, if you're still watching, we have the closing ceremony. So if you go to the top of the screen, you can see the schedule. Uh, you click, we're on track number five. And if you click on the next session, it's a closing ceremony with Burr Sutter. Well, we might have something for you there. So I hope to see everybody there. Bye.